Hi everyone and thank you for watching another episode of Gaffer and Gear. Today it's another gear review and I'm looking at the small rig RC220B. This is a 260 watt Bowen mount light, bicolour from 2700 Kelvin all the way up to 6500 Kelvin. Now it boasts very accurate CCT, it boasts very good colour render scores and it also boasts very good white point placement at 3200 Kelvin and at 5,600 Kelvin. All right, so this is an entry level light. So if you're after something like DMX, this is not the light for you. Now, it really is no thrills. It does have some special effects, but they're pretty ordinary. But in terms of just having a light that gives you good quality light, this thing really kicks goals. So I have a lot of lights come in for review that are entry level, and two thirds of them don't get onto the channel. In fact, I wasn't meant to be reviewing this light in this episode. I was meant to be reviewing the $5,000 light over there, which failed testing. I'm not gonna mention which one that is. All right, now, in terms of the pros for this unit, it has three big pros that make this arguably the best bicolor light that I've reviewed in terms of the quality of light that comes out of it. Number one is the CCT accuracy. It has a CCT range from 2,700 Kelvin up to 6,500 Kelvin with 100 Kelvin increments of adjustment. Now in terms of the accuracy, it is typically accurate over the entire range to 32 Kelvin. Now they're my readings, not the manufacturers. So what I mean by that, if you dial in a Kelvin, a target value, anywhere on the range, you are typically going to be within 32 Kelvin of what you dialed in. The next big plus for me is the TM30 color render results. The lowest score this recorded, which was at 6,400 Kelvin and 6,500 Kelvin, was a 93. The next lowest score was a 94, and everything below 5,600 Kelvin scores a 95. Now, the overwhelming plus for me with these is the white point placement, particularly at 3,200 Kelvin and at 5,600 Kelvin. Now to explain what's going on here, I'm gonna use a CIE graph. And this graph has the Planckian curve running through it, or the black body curve. So this curved line represents what the human eye arguably perceives to be white light. At one end of the line, we've got warm white, and at the other end of the line, we've got cool white. Now if we stray upwards from this line, then the light starts to go green. If we stray below the line, the light starts to go magenta. All right, so imagine this is our Planckian curve. Above the curve, the light goes green. Below the curve, the light goes magenta. And we've got a bicolor light running from 2,700 Kelvin up to 6,500 Kelvin. Now, what a lot of manufacturers do is they put their color emitters so they're on the curve or very, very close to the curve, which gives you a very good white point at this place and at this place. But the problem with bicolor is you're fading in between. And when you fade in between, it tracks in a straight line. It doesn't go in a curve. So this straight line is below the Planckian curve through here. So this is magenta, particularly at 3,200 Kelvin and at 5,600 Kelvin. So this is a common problem. Now, these guys have done something different. They've placed their color emitters above the Planckian curve. So the little bit of a negative with this is that at 2,700 Kelvin and at 6,500 Kelvin, the light is green. But remember, it tracks in a straight line and it crosses over the Planckian curve at 3,200 Kelvin and very close to 5,600 Kelvin. So at those points, you get very good white color accuracy or white point accuracy. Now, the other plus with this is if you're dialing in a Kelvin in the middle, like say 4,200, 4,300, it's not gonna be as magenta as with other bicolor lights. All right, so let's start going over the negatives. Now, the cooling fan runs very quiet. It's currently running and I'm standing next to it and you probably can't hear it. But here's the issue, it is not consistent. When the light cools down, the fan turns off, and when the light heats up again, the fan will turn back on. So you've got no continuity of background noise if you're working somewhere that's a very, very echoey environment, like say a kitchen or something like that that's not carpeted. Now the next negative for me 
is with the menu system. It is very easy to drive, but it has something that irritates me. And uh, here's what it is. One knob controls your CCT. So for example, I can dim, and if I press the knob and spin it, I can now change my CCT. And the other knob controls my special effects. So here's the problem. If I'm fumbling around, I can't see the back of the light. It's very easy to end up in an effect mode when all you wanted to do was change your CCT or change your brightness levels. The next possible negative could be the CAB arrangement. It is using a striped formation and not a checkerboard. This is to make it cheaper to manufacture. So the problem with this is it's not gonna to work too well through something like a projector mount. Also, there's no glass covering over the front of the CAB. The only other possible negative I've got is the handle. It's not a ratchet handle, so you can't lift it up and put it into another position. So it could get in the way if you're trying to rig this onto say a clamp or an articulated arm. But uh, in terms of that, the whole rigging point being underneath, this light is really made to stick on a light stand for say your corporate interviews or possibly even a run and gun light. Now, one positive I almost did overlook is it does have an umbrella mount here. Okay, so let's go through how much it costs and what you get for your money. So I've seen it listed for 370 US dollars and 530 Australian dollars. So for that money, you get the bag, which is quite well constructed. Now everything in the bag is quite well protected. Now in the top of the bag, you get a shoulder strap for the bag. You get a sheet of stickers and a very well thought out instruction manual. You get the light, which has a removable protective cap for the COB. You get your regional power cable and you get the power supply. Now, one thing to note with the power supply, it doesn't have any sort of strap for mounting it to your light stand. And you get the reflector, which is a faceted dish to give you maximum light output. Now, here's something I'd suggest getting if you wanna run it off batteries. You can get this plate as an optional extra, which is about 30 US dollars. So it's a V-mount plate with a stand mount on the back. You also get a three pin XLR to detap adapter. Now, when you run the light off a battery, you can run it at 50% brightness off a 14.4 or 14.8 volt V-mount. And if you're running it off a 26 volt V-mount, you can run it at 100% brightness. All right, let's go through operating this and it really is straightforward. You've got a three pin XLR for your power and you've got your on off switch on the opposite side. Now running through the screen, you've got a black line. This knob controls everything above the black line and this knob controls everything below the black line. Currently, I've got my brightness selected above the line. Now, if I wanna to change to my CCT, I press the button down. Now I can change my color. The other knob controls everything below the line. So we can select our frequency and we can select our effect. Now at the moment we're in normal. So if I press the button down, I can change that to any of the effects. I've got paparazzi, fireworks, lightning, faulty bulb, TV, breathe, flash, Party, flame. Now the last thing on the light is the reset button. And this resets your Bluetooth connection for your mobile phone app, which I'm not gonna get into. Okay, let's have a look how this thing goes with and without its reflector, and also take a look at some other modifiers that I've got sitting around the workshop. With no modifier on, the light has a huge even spread so it can easily light a large background or evenly fill out a large softbox modifier. This is regardless of the CCT that you dial in. And the shadows are as sharp as any other COB. With its supplied reflector, there is a hotspot and the beam isn't perfectly even but it's better than a lot of dishes that I've seen. 
the results are the same regardless of what CCT you dial in. Next, I tried the Forza Fresnel. Now, it's not a perfectly even beam. It does have a bit of a dark ring, but it's not too bad at all. The results are the same regardless of the CCT that you dial in. The light barn door slashes as good as it does when it's used with a Forza light. Regardless of the CCT that you dial in. And it spots up with a really tight beam, giving you a lot of light level if you need it. Now just for giggles, I tried it with the aperture projection mount. And as I suspected from the stripe pattern COB, you do get a very uneven color distribution across your beams. Let's start going through the data I've collected, starting off with the AC power draw. The maximum power draw recorded over two days of testing was 279.6 watt. At 3,200 Kelvin, I recorded 243 watt, and at 5,600 Kelvin, I recorded 273 watt. Here are the brightness readings, and the meter was set to 400 ISO at a 1 50th of a second shutter at 25 frames per second. With the dish in the center value, you get seven times more light than you do off the bare COB. However, just off center, which is roughly about here where I took my readings, you get about four times the amount of brightness. So I think it's more realistic to set your expectations at getting four times the amount of light off the reflector. When using the Forza Fresnel, I got 2.4 times the amount of light in flood and a little bit over 12 times the amount of light in spot. Now let's take a look at the CCT average accuracies and they're quite surprising. Between 2,700 to 4,000 Kelvin, it was typically accurate to plus or minus 37 Kelvin. Between 4,100 to 5,000 Kelvin, it was typically out by plus 61 Kelvin. Between 5,100 Kelvin and 6,000 Kelvin, it was only out by plus 19 Kelvin on average. And 6,100 Kelvin and above, it was only out by plus 11 Kelvin on average. Now let's take a look at our TM30 color vector scores. Between 2,700 Kelvin and 5,400 Kelvin, it scored 95. From 5,600 Kelvin to 6,300 Kelvin, it scored 94. 6,400 Kelvin and 6,500 Kelvin, it scored 93. Now let's take a look at our white points measured in delta UV. At 2,700 Kelvin, the light comes in with a plus 0.0031. That means the light is green at this point, somewhere between a 1 8th and a 1 quarter correction gel. Now this is actually a good thing because bicolor lights track linear, which is why at 3,200 Kelvin, the light comes in with a very respectable delta UV of minus 0.0005, which is almost perfect. At 4000 Kelvin, the light is the furthest from the Planckian curve towards magenta that it gets, with a delta UV of minus 0.0025. Now that is roughly the equivalent of a 1 8th correction gel. At 5600 Kelvin, it comes in with a delta UV of plus 0.0007, which places the light almost on the Planckian curve at this point. And at 6,500 Kelvin, it came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0035, which again makes the light green at this point to somewhere between the equivalent of a 1 8 and a 1 quarter correction gel. Let's take a look at some of our Kelvins now, starting off with the lowest Kelvin we can dial in. When I dialed in 2,700 Kelvin, I got 2,846. The TM30 color vector results were 95% average color accuracy with a 98% average color saturation. Here are the CRI scores. Only R9 and R12 are below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0031, which makes the light green at this point to somewhere between a 1 8 and a 1 quarter correction gel. When I dialed in 3200 Kelvin, I got 3205 with an SSI score of 85. The TM30 color vector results were 95% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores, and only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution, and the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0005, which is very accurate. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,483. The TM30 color vector results were 95% average color accuracy with an average 102% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores, and only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. 
and the white point came in with a delta UV of only minus 0.0018, which is very good for a bicolor light. When I dialed in 5600 Kelvin, I got 5606 with an SSI of 75. Here are the TN30 color vector results. And the light came in with an average 94% color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the light came in with a delta UV of plus 0 0.0007, which places the light almost on the Planckian curve, but off the daylight curve to roughly the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. When I dialed in 6,500 Kelvin, I got 6,507. The TN30 color vector results were 93% average color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. Here are the CRI results and only R9 and R12 are below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0 0.0035, which makes the light green at this point to somewhere between a 1 8 and a 1 quarter correction gel. Okay, that's another gear review done and Small Rig sent me this light about five months ago. I've had a massive amount of work on and I've had very little time to work on gaffer and gear, so I would like to thank them for their patience. All right, see you on the next episode. Don't forget to click like and subscribe.